how does Mill come to be on the show, first of all? Well, Jim Barnett, and let me, let me explain. <clears throat> when I talk about Jim Barnett later on, Jim Barnett was one of the two or three most powerful, most influential men in the wrestling business of the second half of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. He, he, he won promotional wars, he had contacts everywhere, not just in wrestling, but in politics, and he got people out of trouble, and he moved money around, and he, he, he's the one that got Roy Shire San Francisco TV and gave him Ray Stevens to go and make San Francisco the biggest drawn wrestling city in the country mm -hmm. in the early 60s. And I mean, it can't be understated how powerful, how brilliant Jim Barnett was at one point. However, this was a time where in 1983, when Ole had sort of strong-armed Barnett out of his piece of the Georgia office, and Barnett responded, he didn't cross Jim Barnett, by going to Vince and making it known that Vince could buy the shares of the Briscoes and himself right. and, and, and uh, uh, Jim Oates, uh, Barnett's friend. And he, that's how Vince got control in 1984 of the Georgia office and the TBS time slot. Barnett worked with Vince up through WrestleMania three. As a matter of fact, he told me himself that he wrote Hogan and Andre checks for $250,000 a piece as payoffs for that night, and Vince tore them up and wrote them $750 a piece because that's what that meant to his company. But, and maybe we need to get Bruce in on this because he was probably around or almost around at that point, uh, Vince fired Barnett. There was a, a split in late 87. Barnett at that point, tried to and by, possibly it wasn't a legitimate attempt but he tried to commit suicide possibly a cry for attention Crockett brought him in as a consultant and when the sale was made to TBS because of who Jim Barnett was because he pretty much saved wrestling on the superstation in the 70s when he won the promotional war with Ann Gunkel etc right. Barnett got an office spot and Barnett knew that that was his last job in wrestling. At his age and the fact that all the territories were going under and Vince wasn't going to take him back. So at this point, unfortunately, and I mean, Barnett would say what he thought in certain circumstances and God, I wish he'd have written a book before he died. Yeah. Because he was one of the guys with Sam Muchnick and maybe one or two other people that knew where everybody was buried and knew everything that went on and all the intrigue behind the scenes with every promoter in the world. He booked the world champion for years. He, he knew everything. But at this point, he's taking his consultant's check because he was not the, I'm not saying he was broke, but he was not the multimillionaire that he lived like all those years and gave the impression he was, and this was his last job. So basically where I was going with this, Barnett's job at that point was to, a lot of cases, say what Jim Hurd wanted to hear. So one of the things, because we were in Corpus Christi, Texas, which is deep South Texas, almost mm -hmm. to Mexico, Jim, still living in the 70s, said, we got to have a Hispanic superstar. And, of course, the biggest Hispanic superstar is Mil Mascaris, according to Jim, who, you know, when he woke up that morning, it was still 1973. <laughs> so they booked Mil Mascaris on the Clash of Champions to draw a house in Corpus Christi. He knew the television went everywhere in the country, right? Yeah, but, oh, okay. but we needed a live crowd in Corpus right. Christi that would make it look good. Other, right. So who's he gonna work with? And Cactus actually didn't know this until last year when I actually I told him on one of his, we were doing one of the Q&A after one of his comedy club on shows. On WWE TV? No, no, oh, no, oh, okay. this was one of his club shows. He didn't, because he was offended uh, that he was booked against Mascaris because Mascaris not only wasn't going to do the job, he right. wasn't going to sell, and he wasn't even going to give him anything. And that's the day I did see Mascaris at the airport without his mask. Yes. And that was, I still get goosebumps, right? You know, but uh, uh, that was unusual to see. No cell phone cameras in 1990, guys. No, you, no, you never saw, no. He, he, he couldn't be on the plane with his mask on. Right. And when he got off, Flair told me, that's Mascaris. Ah, oh, shit, man, that's cool, fuck. Of course, he looked like a 60-year-old Mexican businessman at right. that point, but when he put the mask on, he still had the body at that. In, anyway, I booked Mick in that on purpose because Kevin and I, as I mentioned on the 1989 version, we had backdoored Cactus into a job by making him one of the job guys because we could book anybody. We, Flair didn't see in Mick at that time what we all did. And that's where there's some lingering heat over that for quite a while. But Kevin and I loved Cactus. 
so we booked him as one of the job guys in those matches where the like the Steiners, whoever would beat Cactus and the partner, and then the, the heroes would leave, and then Cactus would drop the elbow. And then after three or four weeks, people were waiting, the, the, the stars, get the fuck out of the way, we want to see the guy drop the elbow. We got him over backwards because we right. had the power to book anybody we wanted as job guys or to do jobs as long as they weren't winning, mm -hmm. right? So that, anyway, I took it a step further. If we got to have Moscaris on this fucking thing, <clears throat> I said, let's put him with Cactus Jack. Because I had seen in Memphis, Cactus did this bump, the Nesty Plunge bump where he got drop kicked and he took a flat back bump off the apron onto the concrete floor. It was the goddamnedest thing I'd ever seen. And I, I wouldn't want him to do it every night, but I, I, we're trying to get this guy over. And I said, I went up to him that night and, and he was like, and Moscow's got there late and he was just blowing Cactus off. He didn't want to do it. You know, he, did, he didn't want to talk about when Cactus said, what do you want to do to me? He didn't want to talk about it, right? <clears throat> I said, can you take that bump? He said, yeah. I said, all right. So that's the way we set it up is that Moscaris would drop kick him. He'd, and, and we didn't explain to everybody. It, me and Cactus were the only ones that kind of knew what that bump looked like, right? So we didn't really tell anybody because I was afraid somebody would ixnay it. We told Moscaris, you drop kick him. He takes a bump to the floor. He'll crawl back in. You hit him with the cross body. One, two, three, you get your hand up. Yay, boom, and Moscow is like, okay, Happy right? about that, yeah. I knew I was doing the commentary. <laughs> boom, drop kick, Cactus takes that fucking bump. We felt it in our feet back at the, at the broadcast desk, and I screamed, Cactus Jack is dead. It was the early version of, as God is my witness, he's broken in half, right? And the people fucking blew. They never seen anything like that, and they heard him hit the floor, mm -hmm. and then, as he crawls back in, we're able to say, once again, look at the fucking goosebumps, seriously. We're able to say, my God, can any man, how in the world is he still living? And he crawls in and Mascaris hits the fucking very anticlimactic crossbody, boom, and one, two, three, and people are like, yeah, get the fuck out of here. And then the fucking band, who was it? Uh, whatever the band was, the guy that was the lead singer in the band that was played was J.T. Southern. He'd worked Memphis also. He was a guy that worked... And they, they, TBS booked this band or her, I don't know who, it wasn't even heard, but just whatever. <clears throat> but the deal was that the guy in the band was a wrestler and he wanted to get in on some shit also. So I said, then immediately afterwards, we're gonna have Cactus Jack go over and get in a fight with the goddamn That's band right. guy. And whether he wins or loses that fight, it doesn't matter because the, all the attention everybody is gonna take away from this thing is that goddamn Cactus Jack is insane. And that's exactly what happened. Now he, why couldn't he make it in WCW? Well, he did eventually through his own hard work, for, right. despite every obstacle. And see, once again, Flair was going to be gone in a couple of weeks, and I was going to be gone shortly after that. And then he didn't have as many, you know, supporters. Well, at but this point, he he does some jobs for Norman the Lunatic in the weeks after, and then he's gone. Yeah, he. At, I think that was that was the point where he decided to leave on his own. Okay. He did that a couple of times because Cactus was so smart and so confident in what he could do that when he saw, I think he did it another time on a, on a big contract, that it, when he'd finally gotten a big contract, but he saw that they weren't using him right, he left and went and did Japan and whatever the fuck uh, until he could come back with a spot because he would rather lose the short-term money instead of being completely devalued on television, and he was right every time. He had great instincts yeah. for that. Um, but yeah, that clash, so the thing was blah, 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 the emergency plan, but Corpus Christi did a sellout 3,000 people paying $30,000. The Clash uh, did a 4.5 rating, 6.7 share, 2,425,000 homes. And the main event peaked at a 5.9 rating and nearly 4 million homes. 